All right, why don't we go ahead and get started. Um, I want to welcome you all to All in the Line North Carolina's panel discussion uh, titled Targeted Gerrymandering How North Carolina A&T Fought Back. Um, All on the Line, as you probably know, is a nonprofit campaign to bring citizens across every issue together to win on redistricting in 2021 for fair maps. Um, and this webinar is actually part of our North Carolina redistricting leadership program. So as for the topic, if you know anything about gerrymandering in North Carolina, you've probably heard about how North Carolina a and which is the largest HBCU in the country, was targeted for gerrymandering with what we could call surgical precision. It was split in half. Um, and then in this webinar, we're gonna get to talk to some of the people who actually helped that fight to get fair maps for a and um, So just to introduce myself first, my name is Laika Shupak. I am the North Carolina State Director for All on the Line. Um, I have lived most of my life in North Carolina. I grew up in the Sand Hills, if you know where that is. And um, before I came to All on the Line, uh, fighting for fair maps was sort of my um, my side gig, my hobby, uh, my passion. And so I'm, I'm very excited that I get to do this um, for my job and very excited to get to meet and talk to some of these people we have on the panel today. So I will go ahead and go around and introduce them. So Brenda, Brenda Caldwell is a lifelong resident of Greensboro, North Carolina. She's a senior political science student at a and where she is serving as the Student Government Association President for the 2020-2021 school year. Um, and then Derek Smith is currently a full-time lecturer in the Department of History and Political Science at a and He teaches courses in American government, Southern politics, mass political attitudes, political behavior, and political theory. And he is also a political education coordinator for the Poor People's Campaign. And then we have Vashai Hinton. Uh, Vashai joined Common Cause uh, North Carolina in September of 2018, and she is working with HBCU students in the Triad region, including at North Carolina A&T, Bennett College, and Winston-Salem University. Uh, and Vashai herself is a graduate of A&T, and she's also a former Common Cause North Carolina Democracy Fellow. So um, thank you all so much for being here. I am so excited to get to do this and get to have you. This is such um, an important issue to, I think, all of us, and it's an important, especially important for a &T. So um, I wanted to start off just talking about a &T itself. Like, why is it such, a, such an important and special institution in North Carolina and the country at large? Um, and I think I'll go to you, Brenda, first. Yeah, um, so a and is special to me personally because um, my family attended a and Both my parents went here. Um, my grandfather was the band director here for many years and my grandmother taught here. So I grew up on campus. Um, and so a and will always hold a special place in my heart. But a and is also a breeding ground for um, activists and leaders across um, all disciplines, but especially in the field of social justice. Um, and so that's why I think a and is extremely special. And it makes sense that you've become such a leader there then. Um, Professor Smith, it, like, as be being someone who's an educator at the institution, like, what's special about it um, from your perspective as a teacher? Uh, a rich history, obviously. Uh, um, even when I was a child, the sit-ins rang true throughout our community. Um, the first person in my family uh, to graduate with a college degree, graduated in 1978, my first cousin, Marilyn Smith Horn. And uh, so it's always uh, held a really near and dear place in my heart. And I knew somehow I'd be involved in this institution. So when I had a chance to uh, uh, jump ship from Fayette State University with a full-time job, I took a part-time job at A&T. I've been here for, this will be my 18th year um, at A&T. Wow, that definitely says a lot. Um, Vasha, you kind of went from being a student activist to now being someone who is an organizer with Common Cause who like works with the students there. Um, like from your perspective, what's special about a and as an institution? Yeah, I think for me, um, kind of it's everything that, that's been said already really, I, the, the legacy of activism, um, when you get there, um, I was a political science student as well, like Brenda is, and you know you 
you know, get to connect and meet with alum and current students who are just doing so many really cool things. It really inspires you. Um, and I think one of the most powerful symbols is the ANT for, well, let me say this. Shout out to Bennett, the Bennett Bells, who did it first. But the statue of the ANT4 um, on campus, and that's like one of the first sites you see when you arrive on the campus, is very powerful um, and very telling about what the school represents. And I think that um, every student that comes through that those doors, I think that they leave with a sense of purpose, and not just a sense of purpose, you know, that they want to just go work somewhere, but they want to like help change something. I think all of my peers in their different disciplines. Um, as they've evolved over the years have really become something special. Um, and they've carried that legacy with them. Even now in the midst of everything, everything that's happening, I've seen people create really cool and creative ways to tie in activism and social justice to whatever it is they're doing. And I think that's one of the things that I love about my school and all of our teachers there. They want us you know, to be aware. They want us to pay attention. They want us to know what's going on and how all these things impact us every day and I, and I will I will say that I mean a big shot a big piece of that is because of the environment that is cultivated especially in our social science departments I, I really gave, gave, give a major shout out to like Derek Smith and other professors um, who, who do that who teach that discipline but um, I think all of it and I and I think that because we lead that that walk and that fight it kind of it gives a little extra and I, I say this as a person who's been to a lot of HBCU campuses they're all special and all campuses are special but I, I think that for me um not just because i went there because I, I i think that you know the students get it um and that's special yeah. yeah no i mean that's so i mean i think that like you both you and professor smith have um kind of referenced the greensboro four or like as you call them on campus the ant four um you know who led that Greensboro sit-in that was such a, a pivotal part of the civil rights movement and is such a salient image for all of us. Like, I think that everyone can kind of picture it in their minds because it was such a huge event. And that is activism that came from A&T, which is, you know, which like just gives you a lot of perspective on what kind of place it really is. Um, all right, so, so A&T is this sort of brilliant, like kind of, um, melting pot and like this catalyst for all this activism, all the civil rights and social justice activism. And then, you know, it became the target of gerrymandering, which is like one of the most insidious things that has happened, that happens in the country and in, especially in North Carolina to disenfranchise people, to reduce their political power. So um, I think Professor Smith, I'm gonna go to you just to give us a little bit of history of like, how did that come about? Um, yeah, well, obviously, the sit-in with the four freshmen from A&T who were um, immediately, actually, simultaneously joined by students from Bennett College, um, that, um, that sort of a nexus in the modern civil rights era sort of begins in February 1960, um, and uh, it's included everything from defending Dudley High School students um, who were denied access to, to a popularly elected seats in student government by the uh, administration in the city um, to um, you know being um, active in divest in South Africa movement in the 80s, um, the A&T Dudley Uprising 69, um, active on the ground um, with the uh, Klan and Nazi shooting. a and has always kind of been thrown into the mix in the students and in many ways the administration um, and faculty have, uh, have allowed the students uh, some level um, of freedom to go out and fight for these good causes. Um, in recent years, uh, that has uh, moved to, uh, to voting rights um, police accountability, the things that are actually affecting the African American mm -hmm. right now, and of course the gerrymandering. Yeah, yeah. So just to go into that, like specifically, um, can you talk a little bit about how A and T was gerrymandered? Like, what was actually happening with the congressional districts when that uh, when that that map got drawn? Okay, um, you, you actually. 
there's two key years, 2011, 2016, where maps were drawn, um, which would eventually lead to this gerrymander, especially in 2016. But it all connects to the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980. Uh, when Ronald Reagan was elected, he had promised to never sign any extension to the Voting Rights Act, which was up for extension in 1982. Um, however, uh, members of his Justice Department, uh, Richard Thornburg, William French Smith, these guys kind of convinced him that they can create um, a system which includes majority minority districts, which will greatly strengthen the Republican Party in the South. And so he decided that it would be okay to go ahead and uh, sign an extension for the Voting Rights Act in 1982. So the next census year is 1990. So um, after a, a court case, a couple of court cases, and the redrawing of the districts in 1990, because uh, every 10 years the Constitution requires that there be reapportionment and a redrawing of the districts. Um, the North Carolina State Legislature redrew these districts in 1992 and um, were able with the uh, nudging of the federal courts to create two majority minority districts where African Americans can vote in candidates uh, to their preference. Now, if you look at the 1992 map, um, you yeah, can Josh, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but yeah. Donovan, do you want to pull that up so people can actually get a look at the maps while um, Smith is speaking? Thank you. Um, so the, the, the second map, the 1992 map, if you look at that real close, if you got a magnifying glass <laughs> <laughs> or a microscope, you could probably see a district right in the middle of the state that looks like a river or a a stream running through the state. It starts in the middle of the state near the top, runs down through the center of the state down towards Charlotte. Um, that's actually a voting district which was created um, to allow Mel Watt um, access to the United States Congress. First time since Reconstruction, an African American was elected to Congress. So that's what we call an affirmative racial gerrymander. That was created along with the first district um, to be districts where you'd have two African Americans who are almost guaranteed to be elected into Congress. So uh, immediately, um, Republican groups and conservatives attacked it as an unconstitutional gerrymander uh, with the court, you know, uh, with the Fourteenth uh, Amendment's equal protection clause uh, as as their, their argument. And so um, this case reaches the Supreme Court in Shaw versus Reno, 1994. Um, it is as painful as it is to go through these, these cases where African Americans are, uh, are, are either disenfranchised or um, where in, in this case, uh, their opposition is greatly empowered. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's hard going through these cases, but this one was particularly humorous in some ways because the way the district is structured um, had uh, um, lawmakers um, saying that it looked like bug splatter on a windshield. <laughs> um, another lawmaker said that if you, if you rode down I-85 with both doors open, you kill half the people in the district. <laughs> <laughs> So it's obviously a strangely configured district. And it was supposed to um, give African Americans representation in Congress, which was big in 1992 because we hadn't seen anything like that um, since Reconstruction. And we were about to get two of those. Um, but when you fast forward um, to uh, Republicans gaining control of the state, they understood that they can take this a step further by simply putting as many African Americans as they could into both of these districts, basically guaranteeing that you could have at least a 10, uh, a 10 congressional districts out of 13 go to the Republicans. 
Um, um, so why don't we pull up, go ahead and pull up the 2011 map so we can kind of look at that. Um, yeah, here we go. So on the left, that's the maps that that um, Republican majority drew in 2011. Right. And the snake is still there. It's, it's just not as long. They basically cut the head off the snake. Um, and, uh, and so, so what you're saying is that, sorry, but like what you're saying is that, you know, when that was originally drawn, Republican groups challenged it as a racial gerrymander. And then when Republicans were in majority, they drew a map that looks pretty similar. Right. Like what was going on there? Right. Well, the, the science, uh, which is just basic math, um, showed them that um, um, what Thornburg and Smith were telling Reagan um, was, was actually true, that the Republican voting strength in the South uh, could increase dramatically um, if you just take as many minorities as you can and put them in uh, the districts that were created for them, basically walling them off from uh, political power through the gerrymander. So 2010 was the perfect storm. In January, you had the uh, um, Citizens United case came down so Republicans can pour as much money into local elections as they could. They had a plan called Red Map, where the mm -hmm. state legislature um, was given um, cookie cutter legislation crafted by the Koch brothers and Art Pope and Americans for Prosperity and American Legislative Exchange Commission. They were given this legislature, um, this, uh, these legislative uh, proposals um, that um, the Republicans would use once they took control in 2010. Democrats stayed at, stayed at home in 2010. Republicans um, won the election and they just simply drew a, uh, a state where it's virtually impossible to defeat um, Republicans. Yeah. So, so we have this 2011 map that's like, you know, very extremely partisan gerrymandered, but relying on race to do that, like you said. And then um, sort of like what's happening in, with, with where, how do we get to this um, 2017 right. map that actually is the map that like sort of we're talking about directly affecting a and right. in a particular way? Right, so, so we, we challenged the, uh, the, the 2010, uh, we did the 2010 gerrymandering. And we challenged it as a, as a racially discriminatory gerrymander in violation of uh, the Voting Rights Act and the Equal Protection Clause. And uh, those cases would um, slowly snake their way through the courts. And eventually um, we got um, cases out of the federal courts which said that these uh, districts were drawn with racially discriminatory intent. So uh, 2016, um, was the year in which the state legislature had to redraw the districts. That was the map that um, drew um, a line right between, right down the middle of North Carolina a and You had almost an equal amount of dorms on one side of the line and then on the other side of the line. Brenda and Vastai can speak more to that, but the, uh, the, the culprits, um, who we uh, had always uh, um, knew by name, um, but we didn't, didn't have the sufficient evidence was uh, David Lewis, um, mm -hmm. who was in the, uh, um, the uh, North Carolina General Assembly, and uh, Thomas Hoffler, who is the mastermind, the map guru. Uh, in fact, he drew maps all over the nation, Texas, Alabama, and uh, subsequently, the federal courts have basically ruled almost all of these maps as unconstitutional racial gerrymanders. And, yeah, uh, yeah. So I think yeah. we'll talk a little bit more about um, Hoffler in a bit. Um, Brenda and Boshtai, I kind of wanted to go back to you with what um, Professor Smith was saying about how a t was split. Like, well, you know, you're really familiar with the campus. Like, what did that actually look like? Um, I mean, Brenda, can you start off? Yeah, so um, campus was split, and so the way that they did it, um, they can tell these dorms, freshmen live in these dorms, freshmen aren't allowed to have cars. And so if you put their polling location off campus, 
they can't go to vote. Um, and so it was weird um, to have students come up to me and they're like, well, I, you know, I registered them to vote and they're like, I went to go vote, but they told me I was at the wrong precinct. And they're like, what do I do by then? Election day is over. And it was kind of like, you know, what do I tell these people? Um, and so it was definitely a weird experience for anti students, um, especially people in leadership looking to tell students, like, we tell you to register to vote and we encourage you to vote and we tell you what's on the ballot. And then there's that extra barrier um, of once you go vote, you might be in the wrong place. And the likelihood that students are gonna go to two precincts in one day is not high at all. So. Yeah, yeah. Actually, Vasha, do you wanna talk a little bit about like sort of that that really intense targeting of students on a at A&T and how that played into the, the way it was split? Yeah, I was actually gonna say I could I, I can actually go back a little bit. Um, I started at A and T in 2013, actually, and so um, we're there for all of this. Yeah, so <laughs> I, I think that when I remember, um, well, of course, initially, of course, the you know the district was already gerrymandered, right? Yeah. Um, in a lot of ways. So um, just I think the reality that a lot of students had never even voted in a truly fair and democratic election. Um, you know, when students heard that and they hear that, they're like, it, it shakes them. Um, I might had a, my sister, she also went to a and and she, um, she talks, that's one, of the, the talking, that's one of the things she says all the time is, you know, she's never voted in a fair election, like ever. And so many students have that story because a lot of times you go to college, you know, that's your first time voting. You know, you look forward to that. And though, so to know that, you know, you're, the, the place that you're voting in, not only gerrymandered, but it's racially gerrymandered, and then even partisan gerrymandered, um, it, it can be, you know, daunting and, and make you even more apathetic towards, you know, the voting process. Uh, I think a lot of students, especially when I was there, a lot of, it was, it was also the voter ID bill was happening, the monster law was in effect, and it was all these different crazy things that were happening at the same time. And so there was certainly, there was a lot of, you know, voter apathy. There was a lot of students saying like, you know, how did we get here? How do we fix this? What can we do? And of course, you know, with some, some things, you know, getting in the streets, you know, it helps. I always help protesting and, and you know, press conferences, they always help. Um, but this was definitely something that had to be fought in the courts. And I think that, you know, students knew that. And so students, you know, they had press conferences, we had camera crews coming out to talk to students. We, you know, did teach-ins. Um, we had one time, I had, um, we actually, with the political science department, we sponsored a week full of events just so students would come out and learn about what was happening in their community. Um, and I think that students for the first time kind of, because you kind of think voting has nothing to do with you and it doesn't affect you. But I, I in some ways, I'm, I'm thankful for, I mean, it's just a bad thing that happened, but I'm also thankful because I think a lot of students for the first time realized, you know, I always say if someone tries to take something from you, tries to take your power from you, that means it's, it actually works, right? And so I think a lot of students realize, oh, they're trying to take something from me because my vote is just that powerful, right? Um, and so I think that like just, you know, that whole process and students learning how to like turn up and turn out and figuring out what to do. Um, and I'm also really saying, I mean, I, I think I'm thankful for the legacy that A&T carries because students, they knew coming in, you know, when, when all this stuff was happening, they kind of knew what to do. I um, mean, we had really great leaders and people around us and I'm, I'm thankful for Smith and Brenda and the, all the SJ presidents that even kind of came before her that really dug in and said like, what can we do to fix this? And like, they wanted to have that hard conversation. Um, and I think, and I think that, um, you know, it, it's a, it was, it was complicated, but it was a good complicated in that I think it inspired a lot of, a lot of young people to do something, to, to get involved, to fight back. Um, I don't, I think the very first protest we had about gerrymandering, no one really understood what the word meant. Um, and we had like 10 people. <laughs> Um, but over time, you know, we, we, you know, more and more students begin to understand. And I think it really hit um, in like, I want to say when the, when in 2016, I think it really hit people when they were trying to register to vote and they were like having to go to different precincts and it was just really frustrating on election day for everybody. Um, you know, you can do what you can to prepare as many people as you can, but 
you know, when you're having to go to a different polling site than somebody else on your college campus because you live on one side and they live on the other, it can be very frustrating. Uh, and it, it is a reminder that something has to change and something has to be done. So I, I would dare say that I think after that 2016 election, a lot of people woke up and were like, yeah, we gotta, we gotta fix this. Um, and I, I believe there was a shift that certainly, um, when I came back as a coordinator with Common Cause, students were fired up and ready to go. Not to sound corny, but they were, they were, <laughs> they, were they were excited and they were like, we need to do something, we need to say something. Um, even the campus itself was having events to talk about, you know, their campus is gerrymandered and yeah. students are deeply impacted by this. So it was, it was good. Yeah, I mean, going off of that, you know, Brenda, you kind of came into like student leadership around this time. How did, um, how did this situation, the gerrymandering, but also like on top of that, a lot of the other voter suppression measures, how did that sort of shape like your experience trying to be a campus leader? Yeah, so it definitely was like the basis of it. So I came in in fall of 2017, uh, but I knew that guy before because her sister and I went to high school together and cheered together. So I kind of, you know, was into social justice and then I came in um, and uh, I was a political science student. So I had Smith as a professor and he's like, this is what's happening on campus. This is what they're doing to the largest HBCU in the nation and you guys need to do something about it. So I was like, oh, well, what am I going to do about it? Um, and Common Cause was really active on campus. So it was kind of easy to just, you know, fall into that and learn about gerrymandering and how it was affecting our campus and what we could do. Um, and so that was kind of the lens that my leadership started from. And so it continued. Um, when we were talking about voter ID um, and just like getting a polling location on campus, those things, like this kind of was the, the basis for me to um, build on. Yeah, so I mean, clearly this sort of spurred a lot of other stuff too, because, you know, there was all this activism around the gerrymandering, but there's a lot of other, you know, voter suppressive stuff happening in North Carolina at the same time. So what are some other um, kind of issues that like came along, like, you know, with the gerrymandering, I think, in a way serving as sort of like a foundation and like waking people up, but, you know, you all did a lot of other stuff. Um, so what are some of the other like kind of wins that you had? Yeah, so originally um, the student IDs weren't going to count as voter ID, and so that was going to disenfranchise a lot of students who are from out of state or students who don't have an ID for whatever reason. Um, and so we were able to get those approved, and then the law was scrapped, I think, but that was a win. Um, and then we didn't have, um, the primary date was during our spring break. And so students weren't going to be on campus because a and requires you to be campus for spring break. Um, and so we went, um, there were a lot of students actually, we went to the Board of Elections, we created a petition, we had over 2,000 signatures um, requesting an early voting site on our campus and um, we got it. So that was also another win that kind of stemmed from this very major conversation. Yeah. You a little bit too, didn't you? <laughs> I will say, in a and inspired other campuses, WSSU, they fought for a polling site on their campus, Fayetteville State, um, I'm trying to think, I think, it, no, not St. Uh, St. Aug, I'm not sure, I think, no, Shaw, like, there were a lot of schools that, because of what a and was doing, inspired other schools to say also, like, hey, we need to do this, so it was definitely, it was, it was yeah. definitely, yeah. Yeah, so, like, a and like, you're saying like really inspired like other HBCUs in North Carolina, which we have like quite a few to do similar things to advocate for similar things. Um, something I kind of wanted to go back to and maybe um, uh, Professor Smith, I could start with you on this is that, you know, we know that like the um, 2011 maps were overturned for racial gerrymandering and then we get these maps that were drawn in 2016, we get these 2017 maps that um, you know, split A and T in half and sort of at the time the justification is, well, we're not racial gerrymandering, we're not looking at racial data, we're just um, making a partisan map. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about like partisan and racial gerrymandering, like what is the difference in North Carolina or where is the overlap there? Because it seems really um, like the way that the map was drawn for A and T seems to like really call a lot of that into question. Yes. It, uh... There is a lot of overlap and it's confusing, especially when we get in court cases. Um, if legislatures um, 
are crafty in the way in which they draft their uh, legislation, um, then they can find judges or judge panels that'll, that'll um, affirm a racial gerrymander when it's obviously a racial gerrymander. Right? Um, the, uh, so what we have going for us as a people being African-Americans systemically discriminated against when it comes to voting. So we have a section two of the Voting Rights Act, which basically says you can't pass any law, which, which results in, not whether you intend it or not, but if it results in discrimination, then that law could be invalidated. But the voting, the piece of the Voting Rights Act, which made that um, um, a real uh, uh, cool piece of legislation for us, was that if any jurisdiction that had uh, fell underneath the Voting Rights Act, and there were provisions in the Voting Rights Act, Section 4 and 5, which put a formula out there which said that if you did this to prevent African Americans from voting, or if you discriminated historically, like with um, grandfather clauses, literacy tests, uh, or if 50% of the African American population hadn't voted in previous elections, then, then you got to abide by the Voting Rights Act. And, and sections four and five meant that any jurisdiction which would change its laws would have to uh, get approval from a U.S. district court in D.C. or the uh, Justice Department, the Attorney General. And so um, we were solid um, moving in the right direction um, with uh, the Voting Rights Act in conjunction with the 15th Amendment. Um, and until 2013, when the Supreme Court gutted sections four and five, and uh, not so since sections four and five don't apply anymore, these jurisdictions can basically pass any law that they want to, and they know that the courts are going to get clogged up with uh, with cases on their docket that that are voting cases and then a lot of them aren't voting cases, they're just cases which reach the court. And you may never get relief. We started uh, our um, judicial challenges before the voting rights was gutted in 2011. And uh, here it is, we gotta redraw the districts again because it's 2020. I mean, it's time to do it all over again. And we never really got the injunctive relief or the relief in the courts that uh, that we need. We're, we're almost there um, in 2020. Um, the, uh, the districts, that the district line which uh, split A&T in half is no longer there. A&T is now in one congressional district, which is a predominantly uh, Democratic district, slightly. Um, so th there's that. So the racial gerrymander, uh, there are several cases in which we've had victories. We've never had a victory ever in the history of the Supreme Court or federal courts, well, in the Supreme Court on validating the partisan gerrymander. The recent case which came about in 2019, which actually even listed A&T, always argued the partisan issue because they were attacking partisan gerrymander with the philosophy being, if you can do away with partisan gerrymandering, you don't have to worry about any other type of gerrymandering. You can convince the courts that gerrymandering is basically unconstitutional and undemocratic. We respect that, um, but we, we like relief too. So <laughs> I, I thought that uh, we could have made a, a strong argument um, uh, on you know, just, the, uh, just the fact that you have the largest HBCU in the nation where the vote has been diluted because the Supreme Court has already said that that's yeah. Yeah, so I mean, just sort of like trying to distill some of that. It, it, just, it North Carolina, it just happens to be the case, true here that partisan gerrymandering and racial gerrymandering have a huge overlap. And yeah. you know, targeting what even when you're doing what you call partisan gerrymander, you're targeting an HBCU like that. It's really, um, I mean, it's really difficult to just say like, okay, that's just partisan when you have this huge population of black students who are voters. Um, Avashi, I kind of wanted to go to you about like sort of that, um, the feeling like maybe on campus about that overlap, like that, you know, they're drawing these partisan gerrymanders and but it's affecting A&T in this particular way. And like, how do people think about that? Yeah, I think that 
um I think kind of going back to what I was I was talking about earlier a little bit too I think that people um it was shocking right I think to think about the fact that you know not just your campus but the community that you know your campus sits in has been in some way gerrymandered for like 20 years <laughs> right <laughs> um it it, it you know, it, it's one of those things I think when you think about, um, you know, when you think about what a, you know, a democracy, right, is supposed to look like, I think that people, you know, people question that and they say, well, you know, if this is supposed to be the kind of world that I get to exist in and I get to live in and I'm supposed to vote in and, and you know, be represented and, you know, you know, why does that not happen, right? And so I, I think that um, there's, I don't know, it's a lot of, it's a lot of layers to the whole story, but I, I just think that people, people just want to, you know, they want to know why, and they want to, they do want to live in a world where, you know, their vote is like fully counted, and it fully matters, um, and their community is, is actually represented, right? Yeah. Not gerrymandered, but like represented truly, um, and I think that, you know, and with Smith, even with what Smith was saying, I mean, we, that is something people talked about, right? you know, they're going to wait to the last minute to do the right thing. And then, you know, we're going to have to start all over. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I just, I do think about that a lot. And I think um, a lot of my peers that I went to school with, and even now some of the students that I work with, you know, you know, they're actively trying to figure out like, how do we stop this from happening again? Right. What can we do? Yeah. Um, and I think the conversation is like shift has shifted over the years to like, a lot of people are learning what it means to be you know, proactive both versus reactive um, and learning that one of the things that we have to always fight for is our vote. You know, we have to always fight for full access to our right to vote because if it, like I said earlier, if it was not powerful, they would not try to take it away. Um, and I got that from Smith because Smith always said that in class. Um, so, um, no, super, super powerful message. And so like, keep saying it for sure. Yeah. I did want to come back to something I think Brenda that you mentioned earlier so you know A&T is cut in half in this way in this map and you mentioned how like you know freshman dorms are separated from the other dorms you know can you say a little bit more about like the kind of targeting that it like we found out was going on with those maps yeah so in the database that they found there was information on um, all a and students um, if they were of voting age if they have voted before um, for upperclassmen how they voted if they voted before and so it was you know they kind of had all the information they needed to target like you know these students they just turned 18 so they haven't voted yet but they'll probably lean democratic and they live on the south side of campus in our freshman dorm so let's put their poll in place down the street at this church, even though, you know, there's an actual polling location on campus that they could walk to, that they have class in this building, you know, instead of just putting them there, we're gonna send them across the street. And then you have on um, the north side of campus where upperclassmen live who do have cars and they could drive down the street to the church to vote, but they're gonna be able to vote in the academic classroom building and they can just walk on campus. Um, and so it was that, that amount of targeting like we know how these people vote we know they don't have access to cars um they're not going to get on a bus to go down the street to vote at a church so they probably just won't vote yeah so i mean i i just think that that's so mind-blowing because i know i think smith you mentioned um hoffler as being one of the people who was involved and just the level of technical sophistication to the gerrymandering that was happening is sort of amazing and I wonder like what, um, and, and Basha, I think I wanna come back to you on this. Like you were talking a lot about how this can be disheartening for people. And I think when we know like this level of targeting is happening and it's so precise and it's so complex and that it's possible, that's, like, that's the way these maps are being drawn. Um, how do you, you know, how do you like encourage people to still stay in the fight when they're just like all these really big resources against them. Yeah, I wanna preface what I'm about to say by saying all of my words are things that I've learned in Derek Smith's class. So, <laughs> um, but, but I think it just goes back to, you know, what I've been saying is that like, you know, if, 
if your vote didn't matter, if it wasn't powerful, if it wasn't something worth, you know, utilizing, they wouldn't try to take it from you. And I think that like just remembering that, you know, when when there's anytime there's some power shifting or dynamics existing somewhere, someone's always gonna want it. Someone's gonna want to try to capitalize off your energy, off your space, off your time. So, you know, taking your vote from you benefits them, right? Or diluting your vote benefits them. And so us actively always, you know, fighting and you know, being proactive about it, um, I think. I think that that's important. Um, I, and I think that one of the things that I always tell my students um, that I work with now, which is so crazy to say that, um, what I tell the students that I work with now is, you know, um, you know, sometimes you have to take your power back. Like sometimes someone might gonna try to take it from you, but you have to take it back. And you gotta learn how to do that. And I think a lot of the tactics as an organizer, you learn a lot of, not just as an organizer, but I think it naturally, like as a human being, you learn about tactics and things that are your strengths and what can I do to help, you know, create this table where my people can have power. Um, and, I, and I think that, you know, teaching people about those tactics and those, those strategies and like, how do we do this and how do we organize ourselves for the, to, for, to fight this fight for the long run? Um, I'm, I, I think about all the people, all the coalition partners, all the students, all the the people like Smith and Reverend Barber and Bob Hall and Bob Phillips and all the people who were fighting this gerrymandering fight before I was, um, they were fighting, you know, the voter, the, the, um, the, uh, the voter, the voter, the monster bill, I'm so sorry, the monster bill that was, that was in place, like all the different things, these different battles that all tied into really just trying to silence, you know, black and brown folks in North Carolina and like that long fight that existed for so long, I think about that and I'm, and I'm reminded always, you know, this, you know, this fight, you know, it's, it's not going to be a quick fight. You know, the, the, the energy and time that people put into disenfranchising, you know, black and brown folks um, is, 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 is real. <laughs> I mean, you know, you have a whole person, Thomas Hoffler and, and, you know, we had a whole entire general assembly of folks in North Carolina who were literally zeroed in and focused on gerrymandering, <laughs> you know, you know, black and brown people for 20 years, right? And so I, I think that, you know, it's important just to be reminded, and I try to remind people, you know, this, this, is, this is important work. You know, nothing is going to change if, if we can't, you know, if nothing else, just start with your community. I mean, if yeah. you can't change anything else, you can at least start with your community. And I think those fights help, you know, paint the big pictures that help keep us going. The a t four went down. They went down to, you know, downtown and, and sat. They, I'm sure that not, they did not think for a moment that, that what happened after what happened, but it did. And that little one moment they took to fight for access in their community turned into a national, you know, a national showdown for, yeah. you know, anti-racism so yeah yeah no that's a really good point and I feel like all of you have been really doing that at a and I mean A&T has been so pivotal in these sort of fair maps fair maps fights in North Carolina in general um Professor Smith I wanted to come back to you like maybe for some context though so you know clearly you like you showed us how this kind of gerrymandering has been going on since the early 90s at least you know or like at least particularly dealing with that district but what has changed? So like, we know this has been happening for a long time, but in the past few years, how are things different? You know, like how is the fight different? Um, the fight continues, but one of the things that, that we've learned um, just by familiarizing ourselves with the history is that the fight never ends. Um, when you begin to link the opponents of voting rights, um, to the things um, that um, have come to bear to, to suppress the vote. It includes people like John Roberts, who is the Chief Justice of the United States, uh, one of the most vociferous opponents of, uh, of the Voting Rights Act. And, uh, but he's, you know, he's Chief Justice of the United States. He's the one who wrote the opinion in Shelby versus Holder 
which says we don't have to deal with this problem anymore anymore because America is not the racist country that it was in 1965. So it, it never really ends. But I, I do want to bring up this point. I think it's important for the legal experts who might be listening. We often look to the 14th Amendment and the Voting Rights Act um, as the remedies um, against voter suppression. I think we also need to bring in the 13th Amendment and give it some power and luster that it's been losing, especially when it comes to police accountability and mass incarceration. Um, the, the court has ruled that any public policy which, con which continually conveys a badge of inferiority on a minority group is inherently unconstitutional. So not many people are arguing cases on the 13th Amendment when it comes to voting, but I think it'll go a long way in trying to convince those who support John Roberts' position that uh, racism is a, is, a, is a relic of the past and systemic racism when it comes to voting is not something that we ever need to consider, uh, especially in light of the fact that within hours, Alabama, Texas, North Carolina, um, within hours after um, Shelby came down um, in uh, 2013, uh, they rolled out these suppressive, uh, um, these voter suppressive acts. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's changed, but not really. You know, we, they're talking about right now, we're talking about naming the bridge after John Lewis, which we should, as a matter of fact, I think we should name the whole state of Alabama after John Lewis. <laughs> but uh, they're talking about naming a bridge after him. But the Supreme Court gutted the Voting Rights Act. We still have no remedy on that. Yeah. And Congress, Congress can fix it. The Supreme Court gave them an out. They didn't, they didn't rule sections four and five unconstitutional. They said they're outdated. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, we're still waiting. We call it a, a it's, it's, it's an effective way to filibuster. Yeah. And until uh, the Senate changes, you know, we're not gonna, we're not gonna see any relief in that regard. The House passed the bill, but the Senate, the United States Senate, they're still sitting on McConnell's desk or in his trash bin, one. Yeah. Um, so yeah, things are changing, but uh, not necessarily for the better. We have some, we have some areas where we can make, um, you know, we, we can look forward. The whole, even uh, the, the federal courts as structured under Donald Trump have been handing us um, decisions that are favorable here and there. And, um, and, and you know, we, we thank the courts for that. Um, yeah. but, but we really, we, you know, we really got to keep our nose to the grindstone because uh, the methods change. And, and now it appears that there's a whole new um, uh, opportunity for voter suppression uh, proponents um, to uh, disenfranchise, particularly minority and uh, minority uh, voters uh, with the COVID-19 and things like that. So it's, it's a constant. Yeah. yeah, it seems like all of these things are coming, they're all tied together, right? So you get the Shelby versus Holder decision that um, you know, um, gets rid of sort of pre-clearance that these different jurisdictions that had a history of discrimination needed to do. And out of that, you get these gerrymanders and you get these voter ID laws and like all these other kinds of voter suppression, suppressive measures just like kind of um, come out of that decision all like all together, all interconnected. And, and then like you said, also we have all of these issues of people who are formerly incarcerated being prevented from voting. And that's on top of that, that's also like racially determined thing. And yeah, it's, um, it's a, it's definitely, it's definitely overwhelming. It feels like, and, and you're right, you know, we're dealing with a situation right now with COVID where, um, you know, some minor stuff has been changed by the legislature just for this election, but they really have not gone as far as they need to to enfranchise people. And, you know, we don't know what the prospects are of, of that and how that's going to have an effect. Um, 
And Brenda, I saw you kind of nodding, so I don't know if you have a particular thought about the sort of the voting access, voter access, like for this fall for students coming up while you're going to be in this student government position. Yeah, and that's definitely a, a huge concern. Um, my fellow SBA presidents at other campuses and I have been talking about like, how can we, is it going to be safe for us to tell students to go vote? And what do we tell um, immunocompromised people? And what do we tell people who are high risk? Um, and it's, right now we don't have any concrete answers. So we're just kind of trying to look to um, our state boards of elections and our local boards of elections and you know, ask them, what are you all doing for students? Especially in Greensboro, there are so many college students here and that's a big chunk of the population. So what are you all gonna do to serve your constituents here? Yeah, Basha, I don't know if you wanted to add to that with the work that you, you know, do in that area um, and what it's kind of looking like in the fall for you. Yeah, I'll, I'll echo um, some of the things that Brenda has said. I think um, trying to, uh, Put, really, it's about trying to put pressure on our state board of elections and the local board of elections um, to help make the process as easy as possible for folks. Um, I'm even taking it a step further and also thinking about like our, um, particularly like our black and brown people who are like older um, uh, and or, you know, disabled and, and like maybe they can't, you know, it's not safe for them to even be you know, in the polling site or around other people. And also, you know, the general, the fear, I think that the general fear that a lot of black people have with like vote by mail, people don't think about that stuff. They're like saying, oh, go do vote by mail. But, you know, history, the track record has shown that when black people use vote by mail, <laughs> our things go missing. So, um, you know, I, I think that, you know, just trying to make sure that the process is easy as possible. I will say one of the things that I've been told we will have is like online photo registration and I'm interested to see how that plays out here um, for the first time and if it'll even be a fair you know or a complete process I mean we have um, online voter registration now but even with that it's tricky because you have to have a, light, a North Carolina license to register to vote and I mean as we know there are black people and there are people who are you know poor or you know displaced who may not have um, access or even have a North Carolina ID to even do that. Um, and so you, there are all these, these barriers and, and things that, are, that, are, that exist. And so just trying to figure out, you know, how do we move forward and how do we like figure out the best answer and like, what do we push? But I think the most important thing for us to remember is that like, we are, you know, we're problem solvers trying to fix things and solve all the world's problems, of course. Um, but, but I think that, you know, when you, when you sign up to do a government job, you know, it's, 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 it falls on you to figure out the best possible solution for everybody. We chose you to represent us. Um, so when you want to sit on the State Board of Elections or you want to be on the Board of Elections for Guilford County or Juan County or for Scythe County, you know, at that point, you decided I want to own this responsibility of figuring out how I can get the people in my district to vote um, and make sure they have access um, to whatever they need to do that. Um, and so what it, I think, you know, just, you know, putting pressure on elected officials to make sure we have the best possible process is just kind of what I've been like looking at. Um, we, we elected you. We voted for you. You've been appointed by people that we elected. Um, and so we need you to do your job and like figure out the best possible process for that to happen. So yeah. So um, so sort of like uh, we'll head into we'll we'll spend a little time um, letting uh, people ask questions in a minute. But sort of to, like to wrap up this part of the discussion, I wanted to try to end on something positive. So you all have done that, right? You you know, A and T, the students and other campus leaders really advocated during this whole because of this whole gerrymandering issue. Um, and you all pressured your like legislators and made this a huge story. It's a na it's a national story. Um, and then, you know, last year we did get maps where now a and campus is kept together. So like, what did that feel like when you all heard about that? And I'm going to go to Brenda first because I know that she might have to leave. Yeah, um, so I'm actually good to say, but um, it feels really good to see the work that people have done long before I came to A&T um, end in something good. And I think it also was a good experience just for students to, 
like have something to organize around. Like freshmen who came in in 2018, they hit the ground running and it was like gerrymandering is happening on our campus. Like I think that sets a tone for a lot of new Aggies who came in. So um, it was a good experience and it's definitely a good feeling to know that we have their map for now. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know, Professor Smith, if you want to follow up on that. Yeah, I was sitting here chuckling to myself because there are students that entered North Carolina A&T in maybe 2016 and um, never saw or met um, a person from the United States Congress that represents them or, or a candidate <laughs> until 2019. Mm -hmm. And then we saw a million of them. And mm -hmm. that was as a result of uh, redrawing the district maps. Now, um, the candidates have to be responsive to the students. They didn't have to be responsive before. And that's, that's the effect of diluting communities of common interest, which violates the Voting Rights Act. Uh, yeah. uh, section 2. Yeah, I mean, the a &T students are like, a very substantial voting block in that new congressional district. They have to be listened to. Yeah, it's, it's the largest concentration of African American voters between the age of 18 and 25 in the state. Wow. So it, it's no, you know, it's, it's it, why wouldn't they come after us? <laughs> uh, on top of on top of the history that, that we have for pushing back um, against oppressive policy. You know? so, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, yeah. and Hawthorne files show that, right? Yeah. Ashley, how about you having sort of come in as a student and then becoming sort of like a, an organizer and a um, coordinator yourself? Like, what was that like well, you, when you saw that happen now that you're in this sort of professional position where this is like what you do? Um, well, I will, I'll, I'll say that, I mean, I still have some of the same sentiments that I had when I was a freshman. Um, you know, just kind of being in shock of how, how far people will go to keep people from voting. It's, it's insane, actually. Um, but I'll, I'll say that, you know, just going from a student even to now, like, I do see that, like, people power works. When we show up and we hold, you know, not to sound corny or cliche, but we hold people accountable, it works. Um, whether you do that at the courts, you do it through protesting, um, you threw it, you do it through um, advocacy, lobbying, whatever you need to do. Even if you decide, I need to tear this down and build a new one, whatever it is that you need to do, it works. When people show up, it works. And I do want to give a shout out to um, like Reverend Barber and even the Poor People's Campaign, like this idea of like fusion politics, when you bring like all these different kinds of people together to like push on this, this issue of like poor white people, you got black and brown people, you got poor black folks, you got, you know, Asians, and then you have, you know, people from the middle, like everybody, right? Um, you have um, Hispanic people, you have like a little bit of everybody working together to fight for the same cause. I think that things change. And I think that um, in North Carolina, over over time, you've seen that. I think, you know, that is one thing that I think North Carolina does very well. When there is a fight to be fought, you see people from all walks of life come together and say, we're going to fight this fight together. Um, and I think it's a very beautiful and really dope thing. And I think it kind of sets a blueprint for other states, I think, um, at least, for them to follow. Because um, we've seen a lot of bad things happening in North Carolina. We've also seen a lot of really good things happen as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that um, that speaks to me so much because I feel like when I talk to people who, you know, are from outside the South and they're like, oh, you know, North Carolina, what a horrible situation. Because they see all the news stories about like the bad things our legislature is doing. Um, but, you know, I always feel like North Carolina has the most vibrant progressive movements anywhere in the country. This fight has been going on here for so long and there are so many passionate and talented people involved that um, it makes it harder to be discouraged. So definitely, I definitely feel that. Um, so now I think we're, we'll leave a little bit of time for people who have questions. So if you have a question, um, you can hit the button at the bottom of your screen to raise your hand and then we can come to you, unmute you. 
Um, or if you um, can't do that, you can type a question into the chat. Um, so I'm going to go to Sylvia. Sylvia, you should be unmuted. I will just hit the unmute then. Um, <laughs> it's nice to actually see you. I've listened to you on a lot of the AOTL um, monthly meeting um, volunteer calls. Mm -hmm. So it's nice to kind of meet you in a sense. I have a, um, a serious question for the students because is a and going to have in-person classes? How are you going to address if if your classes are all online? How do you address them even being where they can vote? Or are you, I mean, one thought is go back to your parents' home or, you know, if you can or wherever and re-register to vote with that, with whatever address you have off campus. I don't know. That's a really crazy issue that I think we have to confront in a lot of places. Yeah, Sylvia, do you, um, Vashai, did you want to start? Yeah, I was going to say, if it's okay with you, Brenda, um, I've been talking to, I mean, Brenda, of course, you can still answer too, but I will say we talk to a lot of schools like all the time. And I'll, and I'll tell you this, I, I think that is one thing that people, people are aware of and they know. And I think it's about now at this point, it's about making sure like students are just aware of like for the best thing for them to do in their situation. Cause I will say like we have students who, you know, who go to a and but they still live in Greensboro. Um, so you have students who live off campus, but they live like off campus all year round. So they're still there. Um, and so it's just about figuring out what pockets of people you need to touch and which ones you need to encourage to say, hey, you know, you can just, you know, do, vote by mail or you can vote at home since you're already there. Um, and so it was just trying to figure out the best practice, the best thing for each person. And I think as long as all the students have all their information that they need, um, that as long as they have all the information that they need, they can make the best decision for them, if that makes sense. So I, I, I actually don't see it as this big, huge predicament that a lot of people see. Um, I think it's you know pretty straightforward. I think the most important thing is just making sure students have all the information that they'll need um, to vote this fall. And that's just a matter of, in North Carolina at least, making sure our state board of elections and our local board of elections are getting the right information up on their websites and disseminated to folks. <laughs> and right now that's not happening. <laughs> so <laughs> we're working on that. Yeah. yeah. But Brenda. And, and I'll also add um, that my executive board and I have my political action committee um, working on like a resource guide so we can, um, you know, share it on social media so students on campus, off campus, back at home have access to that and they can know um, where should they vote, do they need to re-register to vote, and what is voting by mail going to look like, all those types of things. Um, and we're just trying to make sure we hit students from every angle because common cause is going to reach some students and then, um, you know, the fun student orgs are going to reach some other students. So just making sure that as many students as possible have access to that information is our, um, our number one goal. Thanks, Brenda. Um, so um, I'm, we have another question that is, uh, was in the chat from Dr. Brenda Fairfax. And D Brenda Fairfax, it's great to see you. She's like one of my favorite volunteers. Um, so it's remarkable that a students and a professor have taken on such action. What other HBCUs are following your lead? Um, so Vasha, I know you work with a lot of other HBCUs. Yeah, well. I was gonna say, um, just like for clarity for the question, is this just referring to like the, the organizing, the gerrymandering stuff, or just like, you know, the general, like fall, the COVID-19 related things? Oh, I think maybe about gerrymandering, I think. That's oh, okay. Awesome. Well, I, I'll say that, um, well, thankfully, um, none of our other schools, none of our HBCUs, at least were Jane Mandarin, like A&T was. <laughs> um, but I will say as far as just like the blueprint for, you know, stepping up and stepping out, um, I think that, you know, just in general, like students are inspired across the state, um, especially, you know, you know, at our HBCUs, of course, I'll say that um, particularly the one, one moment that just kind of stands out to me really, um, well, two moments I'll say. The first one is, um, I remember um, I had there, one of my friends, his name is Tyler Swanson, he's a former A&T student. Um, 
and there was another guy, his name was Charlie Moore. Um, and there was a bill that came out in the Senate um, in, in North Carolina. What year was that, Smith? Like, was that 20? That was 2015? Which one? Senate, Senate Bill 666. Oh, uh, 2013. 2013. Um, and basically the bill was would make it so students, even if you lived at home, I'm, I'm sorry, if you lived on campus, it would penalize your parents for you voting on campus, basically. Um, and like they would get like, basically they, they couldn't put you in their tax or something like that. It was, it was uh, I don't, I think that's right, it's right, Smith? Yeah, there was a tax credit that um, parents would get if their students were away at college. So the state was gonna strip that tax credit. I think it was like $2,500. Yeah. And so they decided to um, go down to the General Assembly and like put tape across their mouths and write like, um, like basically like they were, they were being silenced essentially because they weren't being allowed to vote on their college campus where they were living um, for most of the school year. Um, and so not just A&T, but like students, H, um, students from across the state showed up and showed out um, in that moment. And then I'll say like the second big moment that I remember is um, this, this year actually when A&T students started putting pressure on the Board of Elections for their polling site um, and to make sure their IDs counted for the election. Um, students, students saw that and I can say, say particularly at Winston-Salem State, um, they led a successful campaign to get their polling site back and at Fayetteville State, they led a successful campaign to get their polling site um, on campus as well. Because um, Winston-Salem State, just like a t had had their polling site taken away um, in the last election. Um, and so just this, them just getting out there to fight. And then in general, you had students across the state just fighting to make sure their IDs counted. And that was at all the schools. That wasn't just HBCUs. Um, and a lot of, and it really all started one student. His name is Cole. I cannot remember his last name. I'm so uh, sorry. Riley. What's his name? Riley. Cole Riley. Riley. Yes, he made a petition. And that petition just took over. <laughs> It took over Twitter and Instagram, and then more and more students began to sign it, and other schools saw and made their own petitions. Um, so those two particular moments when students felt directly not just impacted, and they knew there was something that they could do to change it, um, they showed up. And you know, I, I, can, I can reference those two, those two particular pieces. Um, but I think as far as like the just going back to you said, gerrymandering, just going back as far as that, I don't think. Um, not that, at least to my understanding, no other HBCUs were gerrymandered that way, um, but they did have other, they did have support um, from like their peers and, you know, we, I know we had support. We had several protests and the Bennett Bells came to a and to march, um, do march the polls with us to protest against um, the gerrymandering that was happening on our campus as well. Um, because not only did the gerrymander, you know, also dilute the votes of our campus, but, you know, they literally split. East Greensboro, where all the black people live and have. <laughs> so um, it was, yeah, it was, it was different. So thank you. Um, I'm going to go to a, there are a couple questions from Hyatt. I hope you're, I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Um, so Hyatt's asking, um, I live in High Point and I'll be a college student remotely, but how can I get involved in organizing? And just to plug AOTL for a second, I will be following up with all of you for how you can join the redistricting leadership program, which is a lot more of this like uh, educational content. But for people who are in the area, I mean, High Point in Guilford County, um, like what are some local things that that, that person could get involved in? Um, I'll say, I know the Poor People's Campaign, so I'll let Smith talk about that. Um, but what, depending on what school, I, I guess I'm going to ask what school, but I, I don't know if I'm going to ask that. Um, but I, I will say that when you um, start school, um, depending on where you're, where you're going, um, if you can get in contact with um, career, your career services or, some, or a professor that you like, you like, or any professor really, they can point you in the right direction. There are so many programs that exist out there, like internships and fellowships. Um, if you're interested particularly in like political organizing, um, there's an organization called Democracy North Carolina. Um, there's Common Cause. We do internships and fellowships. Um, most of our fellowships, our fellowship program is strictly self HBCU students, um, but we do have yearly internships, an internship program as well. Um, and that's just for anybody. 
um, any college student who's interested. Um, there's also um, Campus Vote Projects. There's Campus Compact. Most schools have two, I think one or two fellows with Campus Compact. But there are a lot of organizations out there. <laughs> if you wanna, I don't know if Lekka's gonna share our information with or not, but you can totally feel free to email me and we can. Um, yeah, can yeah, if you all feel comfortable with that. Um, Vashai, I'll definitely share your email with the panelists so they can get in touch with you um, when I share um, other information about, you know, how to get in touch with me and, um, and all of our programming. So um, I can definitely do that. Um, uh, the second question that I had had was, um, as organizers, how do you suggest that we as individuals investigate our local politicians and stakeholders that influence our communities? Um, and I think I wanted to go to Brenda with this because, I mean, she's the, she's the student activist right now. Um, so Ballotpedia is a good resource to use. Um, you can also just Google their name and like voting history and it'll show you how they voted. Um, all the time they've been in office. Um, your local party um, affiliations may have informational candidates. Um, there's voter guides that go out for every election so you can see um, candidate stances. Look up their website. Um, some of them keep them updated while they're in office and the General Assembly has a website um, for each person. So you can use those resources. Um, and also just people um, like Smith is a really good resource. Like if I want to know, like someone seems like a good candidate, but it's like, are they actually a good candidate? You know, sometimes it's helpful to ask people who've been around that person or who have organized with that person or something like that. I'm um, just to get a better sense of, you know, if they're a good candidate or not. Yeah, and one thing I also want to mention is that um, for state legislative seats, um, our affiliate NDRC, National Democratic Redistricting Committee, does have a candidate pledge where um, candidates have to pledge that they will fight for fair maps and independent redistricting. And so um, if you want to look up NDRC, you can see what state legislative candidates have taken that pledge and, you know, see who is in your area, um, definitely. All right, so I think that um, that uh, we have a question from Suzanne. So um, college age people are going to play an essential role in the elections this year. Um, what is going on with uh, to tell people to apply to work as poll workers, witness signatures, um, I guess just like playing an actual role in the voting system. Um, do have students at a and been like poll workers before? Is that something that is like part of the campus? Yeah. Um, yeah, so students here and there, but that's why I can speak more about it. We were actually just talking about this on a call like last week, I think. Yeah, um, I was gonna say that uh, that has been something that we've talked about. In fact, before COVID, we were actually going to have a pro, we were thinking about having a program where like students um, would actually sign up and be a part of like a three week program where they would be poll workers and then work on election day and during early voting. However, one of the things that um, we've been really thoughtful about and I, and I think it's a really important for everyone to think about um, and especially because we recently found out that black people um, are considered an at-risk population. Um, not having, in college students in particular, who a lot of times do not have health insurance. Um, or if they do, it's crappy and it'll take a lot of their pockets, you know, just not even putting them in a position where they have to, or even asking them to put themselves in a position where they have to put their body on the line in that way. Um, and so one of the things that um, we've been doing is just been trying to figure out how do we just push out, you know, the, the general information that the State Board of Elections is asking for and as far as their recruitment for poll monitors, but also asking people to be thoughtful about it. If you know you don't have health insurance, if you know you're considered an at-risk person, um, a person's, like, do not sign up to do that. Um, and just be, like, diligent and thoughtful about that, because I think that is really important. I know people try to say COVID's not real, but as a girl who has family members who have experienced it, like it is very real. <laughs> um, so please do not play with it. Um, and I and I and I again will go back to I think that you know we do have our state board of elections, and at the end of the day, it's our job to just encourage them to you know do the recruitment. And if you feel like capable, if you feel you can do that job, if you're not again at risk, 
sign up to do it by all means. Um, but I do, I don't believe any student, any college student should sign up to be a poll worker this fall. Um, I, especially black students. I do not believe that at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be, I mean, I think it's going to be a huge problem in general, which is why we obviously need more support from the legislature for alternative situations, because they're just, we know that there is going to be limited amount of people who can, who can be poll workers safely, um, for sure. All right, so I think that that's um, most of the questions and I think we're gonna just wrap it up here, but I wanted to thank so much all of you, um, Professor Smith, Boshtai, Brenda, I wanted to thank you so much for being here. This was super informative and just a really fun conversation to have because you all are so brilliant and have done such great work. Um, and a and itself is such a like unique and special um, place that, you know, seems to foment like this really great social justice work. So I I'm so glad that I got to have you here. And um, I will be emailing all the attendees afterwards with some follow up information and, um, you know, for our panelists, if they feel comfortable, I can give their, their contact information. Um, so you can reach out to them with any other questions you might have. Um, but yeah, I wanna thank you all so much for taking your time out this evening. This was great. Um, and hopefully I will see you again soon in some other um, leadership, of, leadership course event. All right, everyone, um, have a good evening. Um, I hope everyone um, gets a nice dinner and some rest because this was like a lovely but intense evening for me. All right. I will see you all. I will hopefully see you all soon. And I know I'll be working with all three of you at some point in the near future. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye.